You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast, how to turn being underestimated into your greatest advantage with Arlen Hamilton. Journeyers, really excited to have on someone I admire immensely um, that I've met actually in person, and you heard about that in my intro to this podcast, but Arlen Hamilton. Welcome to the podcast, Arlen. Hey, thanks for having me. So I know you get asked this question like every time you do um, like episodes or podcasts with people who are not familiar with what you do. But I think just to start here, so people who are not familiar with your background in venture capital, in the venture capital world, in this space, like what that actually is. And then I actually want to hop into the really good stuff because I read your book, which is amazing. (laughs) And I want to touch upon some of that stuff. So tell us first what it is, what your role is in the venture capital world. Yes. So I am a managing partner and a founder of a venture capital fund called Backstage Capital, which is basically an investment fund that invests in startup companies. And what makes us different is that 90% of all venture capital tends to go or does go to straight white men and has for, for decades. And we, we flip that. I mean, we, we invest in, I think our current portfolio is 37% or so black women. Um, uh, women of color across the board is more than 50%. People of color is, is pushing two thirds, et cetera, et cetera. So we invest in underrepresented, underestimated founders. For us, that is, uh, we started with women, people of color, and LGBTQ, which uh, identify, identify as all three and have started that from scratch, um, officially started in 2015 after working on it for several years and uh, got my first yes kind of halfway. And I've been, I'll turn 40 this year and I've been working on this since I was about 30, 31. Yeah. And so what I find amazing about your story is that you jumped into this world really without any connections, any like previous like knowledge within the space. And I find that so inspiring, Um, you know, in your book. So your book is called It's About Damn Time, How to Turn Being Underestimated into Your Greatest Advantage, which is, I mean, I think this is a testament to everyone like listening to this podcast. A lot of people may feel like they're underestimated, overlooked. And the fact that you jumped into an industry that typically overlooks people like us and created your like your own lane and now is not a gatekeeper, like you said in your book, you help create keys is amazing. So can we go back to how you like first got into this? Because from what I understand in reading the book, like you at first thought you'd, you'd be the entrepreneur, you'd be the one trying to maybe raise fun for some funds for something. Yes. And you realized you wanted to play a, a bigger role than that. Yes. And I, I still consider myself the entrepreneur, right. uh, just built a different product for a different customer. Uh, originally, when I first got into it and learned about this world, I wasn't set, setting out to become a venture capitalist, never thought about that, didn't know what one was for, you know, most of my life. But it was in the research that I did in or started in um, trying to find out what the investor might be thinking when I wanted to approach one. I wanted to start my own company and um I wanted to be really prepared, you know, and a lot of your listeners are these types, right? You want to be pr- super prepared. That's why you're listening to this podcast. That's why you do your research. And so I started researching. And when I came across this st- statistic that, that more than 90% of all venture funding goes to straight white men, and, a third, and, and I know that a third of the country is, is, is white men, I, I just, something stopped me. It's in my tracks. I was just like, wait a second. I, I don't, you know, this is a, there's a bigger problem here. There's a, there's a, a huge issue here. If, even if I can raise money because I've hacked my way, I've done this and that, I know the rules and I, and I fight them. What happens next? Am I still going to be shut out the next step? Or even more importantly, what happens to the hundreds of others who I know personally are, are building? Do they just get shut out because they didn't hack a certain way? They didn't play a certain game? To me, it was a a bigger deal. And I I, I don't want to ever compare myself to Stacey Abrams because I I think she's absolutely brilliant. But it it reminds something that she said to me once reminded me of what I must have been doing. And she is actually a featured uh, review on the back of the book. So I'm so excited about that. Um, But what she said, we were kind of 
getting ready to go and, and I was going to open a speak for like open for her or whatever at this event, this fundraising event. And she was behind, she was backstage and she was talking to a couple of us about, and I was saying, you, you got to run for president. You got to, you got to, you got to run for president. I need you to, this is several months ago. And she said, look, what I'm worried about is fair voting. And that's what all of this energy is about. If I don't fix the voting, whether I run or not makes no difference if it's fixed when I get there. And she has this great experience of uh, not great, not a good experience, but a, you know, a great a grand scale experience of having run for uh, office in Georgia and, and literally had it stolen from her, like really had the battle stolen from her. So point is, I felt like it, we can't even talk about me trying to raise money for a company if the whole system is broken. That that's that doesn't sit well with me. So, I I, I set out and say, well, how can how can I make a small difference and uh, be a seed of a of a of a difference? And that's where I started. Yeah, and because that seed, and you talk about this in the book, and I think that's relevant in all areas of our lives. And sometimes you know you that seed, you won't always see you know the direct results of the plant and the petals and the flowers that bloom from that. Like sometimes you will, like you've seen direct impact on the companies you've been able to raise capital for and invest in. But what I want to get to, because I think this is like fascinating for people that you have this idea and you have the gumption, the chutzpah to go after it. And I think like when I was reading your story and I find similarities between like what you were able to do and why I choose to go after the things I go after and everyone that I've interviewed that has ever done anything amazing, they have the belief in themselves that they can do it. So I want to talk about that confidence because there are people listening right now who have ideas or are thinking of things and they don't necessarily put themselves in that like mind frame of that's them, right? Like mm -hmm. they might like, oh, that works for them. Or that, that was cool that she did that. But I want to start talking about like what allowed you to feel like without the experience that, you know, most would have said you needed and the educational background that you felt confident to do what you did because I think that is where like we can start to really change um, and plant the seeds for people to 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 go after what they want I think I mean it's a few things one at one was early on in life where I, I my mother really helped me instill that in me even though she wasn't someone who would necessarily she she's kind of shy you know and introverted but she wouldn't necessarily so she wouldn't necessarily go out and just scream at somebody but I, I observed her and her her character and I it's something that stuck, uh, stood with me and she told me she's like there's no one that there's you, you're everybody's equal and she was saying that to me to make sure that I didn't treat people poorly you know and I took that as I'm equal to okay I'm everybody's equal but what I think happened is that, and it, it didn't happen overnight, and it wasn't, hasn't been the case my whole life. Uh, I've had people treat me pr really poorly and let them do that. What happened was there was this, this point where I had done so much research and had talked to so many of these uh, leaders in the venture capital space, and I had met with so many founders, and I had done this and this and that, where imposter syndrome became null and void. It became, it, it, was, it was neutralized. When I realized behind the curtain, everybody's just figuring it out. You know, I, I started looking at these people who have millions of dollars under management or billions of dollars even, and these guys who are the 90%, and I'm like, wait a minute, they, I could do that. <laughs> I could do that. And a lot of us could do that. They, they, what they did was instead of, it being that they are truly these 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 thinkers that you just can't even get to their level or you know these geniuses what they were really good at was marketing they're really good at marketing themselves as such as as the uh what is that um i can't think of the, the word for it but they they really um to me, it, I, the, 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 what is it, the uh, emperor's, emperor's clothes. So yes. They're yeah. missing. And so the more th I observed that, the more I thought, okay, I mean, it's common sense mixed with, like you said, gumption. It's, it's mixed with that, um, I'm going to go out there and do it. It's definitely mixed with intent. Like I, I had to know why I was doing it. I had such a bigger, um, uh, mission behind what I was doing and not a philanthropic mission um, but an impact mission for sure a capitalistic impactful mission 
at the same time, double bottom line. And that certainly helped me on days where I was uh, struggling. And it still helps me to see that. Yeah. And you talk about like the education, like the fact now, like if you don't have the the physical and material resources, even as you stand or listen to this, um, that you can be the resource, you can be the money, which I think, you know, with that, um, you get to regain a lot of power because, you know, maybe you don't have the relationships and connections yet, but like what you did, like you spent years researching and learning and building yourself up um, as your best investment. And I find that while, you know, it's talked about nowadays, like, you know, you know, invest in yourself, but in like, what other ways did you invest in yourself? I know you did a lot of like research, right. But you also like, you know, you went after like what you wanted in terms of connecting, uh, connecting with people, cold emails. Right. But not like, you know, you talked about like making sure everything was still, um, tailored to the person you were reaching out to and things like that. So I think just like going through like what it means to invest in yourself and why that was so important because. Yeah. So you're touching a lot of things there. Um, So part of it, part of the confidence that I have, and this was actually something that someone kind of told me this year, like I I hadn't really realized it, Uh, but they were interviewing me and they, they said, you know, a lot of, does your confidence come from knowing you're like knowing what you're talking about (laughs) and I was like yeah because you know that that's how you tie the two together where where I say if you don't have money and you are looking for money you want to attract money you do have to become money and you have to do that through the information and through knowing everything about your lane possible don't let me know more about your lane don't let that next person know more and the tie together is once you do you'll look up one day and you'll realize Realize you know more about your lane than anybody can tell you and that will that will help instill that confidence in you in a big way even so much so that I didn't even realize that was part of it and it's two sections of my book <laughs> but I didn't realize that was the takeaway is that once you do that once you and it's a it's an ongoing thing believe that like it's a daily thing you're listening to this podcast because you are you are refueling for for the next few days uh that that's that's what you do and that's that's good game you know um and uh well, the second part of your question was about refresh my memory reaching out and you know using yeah, your, what you learn to like build yeah. the networks yeah so what the, what you're referring to is that i would send out if i would ever send out mass emails to people uh for to to gain a a, a a job or to ask for capital or for anything like that i would make sure that there was quantity and quality that combined right so i think you have to do things at scale because incrementally it you're not going to get there as quickly as you as you may want and that quickly could still be years but you but more importantly is the quality so even when i would send out messages to dozens of people at a time or even the example that I give in the book about how I scored my first touring gig by doing this um, I would definitely make sure that each email was tailored uh, in a way in some way because you don't want people are not going to react to you necessarily Uh, they're not going to react to spam you know that everybody knows that when you open up something that looks like spam, someone writes to me and they say, dear Hamilton, which is my last name, <laughs> because that's how they <laughs> accidentally put the thing like that sort of stuff doesn't really resonate. But at the same time, you may not be able to write an opus to 100 people at once. So you kind of f- you find a happy medium. Um, and that's one way of investing in yourself is is learning, you know, taking different courses around um, editing. Like copy editing, I think is probably smart. Um, communication, things like that. I think that uh, being able to articulate what you do and 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 and, uh, and any in certain mediums is very important to what right. And a lot of that also applies across scales, right? Whether you're in corporate America and or building your business, entrepreneur, contract, or whatever that works. Like at least skill sets that we're talking about work across all platforms and levels. They, they absolutely do because no matter what you're doing, you are the CEO of you. You are, you know, that you are the CEO of the empire that you're building. So that could be the the uh, the the Uber driver, 
because you got to figure out, okay, how many hours I'm going to do, going to do, what's, what's the weekly amount I'm trying to get here? What, what are my goals? Where am I trying to go to next? How do I upsell? What do I do? Uh, it could be someone building a fund like I, like I have been doing. It can be someone who works at a, at a, a nine to five, like I used to, or overnight shift. All of that, if you're, you're thinking about it, the way that you're figuring out, okay, what are my goals? What do I want to accomplish? What, what does each day mean towards that goal? What, you know, you can't just wake up every day and it's just, okay, this is the, this is the uh, pattern that I'm in and I got to do this, make ends meet. There's more to life than that, no matter what. And I'm saying this as someone who for uh, 90% of my life has been completely broke. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about uh, challenging what you know and what you see in front of you. Because some, sometimes so many people, like it's what they see, that's their immediate environment that influences them. And it's not until they can put themselves and see something and say, wait, and challenge the assumption that, hey, that could be me too. One of the things that I love, because I find that, you know, if you don't have the resources, like as a parent, especially if any parents are listening, or um, if you just being raised by someone who let you who gave, who, who let you go, who basically allowed you to fail and still supported you, I think is like key. So some parents may not have the resources to like put their kids all through like college and pay for everything and, you know, introduce them to the CEO, right? Like on the golfing course. But I find that when you talked about your mom, like allowing you to like live at home and like, you, you know, you went through ups and downs, but like she just was there for you. She let you be was important. And I see that like within my own story with like, when you have parents that just instill that kind of confidence and let you kind of fail and you're, they're there, you know, they're there for you, regardless of who you are, if you're ever on a magazine cover or not. Like, I think that kind of um, reassurance is capital for your kids to help them get to the next level. Let me tell you, my mom, my mom for, I don't know how many years, I had a, I had a music magazine that I published and it was, it was difficult to do, but you know, every few months we put out this magazine and it was a really impressive magazine. And I had all these thousands of people who are reading it and everything and Rolling Stone uh, got in touch and they loved it and everything. And when that magazine was out for years, what my mom would lead with when she would talk to her friends or with people she just met was, do you know that Arlen can type a hundred words a minute? <laughs> That was what she cared about because that happened. She figured that out like when I was 20 and this was happening after that. Right. So what my point is that like my mom has just been so proud of me for, for so many things and so many years. And, and what I know from that is that, or she may joke like, you know, she has like, where's my 15%, you know, <laughs> she may joke about it, but the truth of the matter is, my mom just thinks I hung the moon, whether I am, she thought that when I was on food stamps and she thinks that today, and it's the same, it really is the same kind of temper, uh, temper of tone. It's interesting because she doesn't, she doesn't jump up and down when I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm on CNN or whatever. She's just like, that is so wonderful. That is so, it's a saying that is so wonderful. That's the other thing. And I think that um, I don't have any children, so I'm not going to try to act like I can give a lot of advice, but from the point of view of a, of a child, of a, of a, uh, a child of a really wonderful person, I can tell you um, that just when I call her, there's never a time where I call my mother. I'm, I'm going to be 40, like I said, this year. There's never a time where I call her where she does not say, Arlen! <laughs> I could have just talked to her the day before. And there's never a time where she doesn't make me feel like it is just the joy to, to know each other. And um, that, that helped in those hard times, you know? I don't remember, I don't care, or, nor remember what the bank account looked like on day X of this and that. I really don't. What I care about is even when the lights were out, what I cared about was that she was that she cared that it that it bothered her that her her children were not okay. It wasn't the fact that we were we we didn't have it. We wasn't the fact that we couldn't get it. That didn't matter at the end of the day. It mattered how she felt about it and how what she let us see, you know, in that. So I think that's if you're going through stuff right now where you feel like even my brother, um, uh, to close the sentence, uh, my, my, my brother, a few Christmases ago, before I started making some money, 
he he called me he's so upset and he has children and he said I can't get him anything for Christmas I can't get him nothing for Christmas and I said Alfred your father and my father were never there for any Christmas whatsoever and you're there for all your kids for Christmas that's all they care about that's really all they care about and you know you can't go back three go back three Christmases and tell me what you got right you know (laughs) so that's what you are to your children that's what you are and on the flip side if you if you the negative is is permeating as well they're seeing that as well so that's that's all I have to say yeah no there's these it's that's great Arla I'm glad you actually gave that example because there are these invisible um foundations that we all kind of you know we internally have it's hard to measure like kind of pinpoint our success and why our mindsets are the way and why some successful people do the things they do and have the confidence and I'd say this even if you don't have kids one of the things that I've um I've heard is that like without even having kids yourself like part of it is if you didn't receive that yourself like you may be listening and say well I didn't have that kind of support or that privilege like right if we call that a privilege Mm -hmm. of having a parent who supported you is that you can reparent yourself like it's this thing where it's just like be that voice, be that kindness to you right now that's going through whatever you're going through, right? Like building a business, just surviving in this world, this crazy world and this crazy time is being like what the kind of mother or father that you would have wanted to have, speak to yourself in that way to give yourself that confidence. Absolutely. So now when it comes to, you know, building, so you now are investing, you are wanting to be the, the kind of like that, the waterfall that, that, that springs forth and is able to fill up other little water waterfalls and rivers and streams, right? Like, so you're like investing downward, not only in yourself, but now to other like companies and founders and people of color and all this amazing stuff. I love that, you know, you actually say there's like a danger though to pushing too hard. Um, And I find that in the financial like space, like I'm in the financial independence world where a lot of it is, okay, I want to retire and like, and really when they say retire, it's like, I just want to do what I want to do. Maybe that's quit their job and start a business and or travel the world. And so there is a balance between going after that goal, but like how far do you want to push that limit, right? Like how far are you willing to go for that? How hard are you willing to hustle? Um, and so you talk about, and I feel like it's and key is that like hustling to that goal, like you have to be careful because you can't like fill other people's like cups if, you're, if yours is empty. So can we talk a little bit about how you are prioritizing your self-care so that you can do more in the world? Um, I think that'll be helpful for people right now who are personally trying to do that in their own life, like help others, but then still want to reach their own goals. Yeah, I, I I had a podcast episode. By the way, one your podcast episode uh, for your first million is one of our still one of our most listened to. Oh wow! Uh, people really got a lot from that. Uh, yeah. I think it was because we broke away from the raising a million dollars to or having a million dollars to the when you hit your million uh, download mark from this podcast, which is right. really cool. Uh, but I did have a recently, uh, more recently, I had a um, an episode that said who who was taking care of the caretakers in this moment. And it was just me kind of riffing and thinking about that because so many get overlooked. I, um, I have for the past maybe two, two solid years and maybe beyond that have been really, really doubling down on the self-care, not only preaching it, but practicing it because it is maybe a three year mark, right? Because I got burnt out. And after I after I raised my first fund, which was about 1.2 million in 2015, 16, and invested in my first 30 or so companies, so 25k each for the most part, um, 50k, whatever. I, I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I had it things had changed so much in that time. So that was just a really interesting time. And I was just, on, I had been just on for so many years because I was in survival mode. And once I realized that, um, that there's only so much of, to, of me, of my energy, uh, I hit a wall and I hit it fast and it was not good. And it was like medically not good. It was emotionally not good. I, I was having like a, a breakdown and physically was that was coming across physically and so after that happened I was like you know I I have to I have to be more than a than a tweet I have to be more than 
I have to be as good as or good at good as or better than the tweets that I put out there that are positive. And I have to really look at what I'm doing. And so how that translates today is that my boundaries are like on point. They are so on point. I used to like really envy a couple of people in my life who, and both of them are black women who had really strong boundaries and knew exactly what they're t- like, you, this is my time. This is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm saying no to this. And I didn't know that it was a skill that you could actually build upon, but it is. So if you don't feel like you have good boundaries right now, I didn't have good boundaries for such a long time. I have really great boundaries as far as I can see um, compared to three years ago. And that has made all the difference. So that comes in, it comes with what I will, am willing to say yes to. It comes uh, when it comes to like my, what, 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 how much time I give to something, um, how many, where, et cetera, what, what it is, what the topic is. And then it also comes with like the, the value I put on that time. Like, you know, um, there's a whole chapter in the book where I talk about uh, how I got my speaking fee to what it is today, which is um, my second highest revenue stream. And completely wouldn't have, I mean, there's two chapters because one I had to get over stage, right? And then the second was how, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> how I then turned that into what it is today. Um, and and I, you, you can't, uh, you can't get where you where I've gotten from zero to where I've gotten in this short amount of time without having established some some boundaries. So that's where it starts. Yeah, that's where self care really starts for me. And, and I am making sure that I don't stray from that even during a pandemic. I mean, it's even more important. Yes, I was going to say that. And self care can be like free, right? Like it doesn't have to be the elaborate. Um, it can 100%. really just be taking space for yourself. Yeah, I say, man, if you, if there is a door in your uh, apartment or home, if you have an apartment or home, again, I've been homeless too. So again, I check my privilege everywhere I go. But if you have a door that locks anywhere, that can be the first step to your self-care. If you don't, or if, even if you do, but you want a different alternative, headphones. Headphones are self-care, are part of self-care. Take yourself away on a podcast and a ebook. I mean, an audio book and a song and a playlist. Um, t- that's you, you know, take yourself away from it all. Right. Now, I know we have to wrap up soon. I do want to just touch upon your personal, like, financial goals, right? So, like, this is a personal finance podcast. And, you know, we could talk about, like, reaching goals, whether it's pay off debt, saving, investing, whatever that is. Is there anything that you right now, like on your horizon that you're like, you know, that's the next personal finance goal I want to meet? Yeah, I would. um, Well, I have started investing in other people's funds, uh, small investments, but very like at an inflection point for them. And in fact, some of them were like the first investment, like someone did for me. So I, what I am dabbling in it now, and what I want to be able to do is uh, on a yearly basis, have a certain amount and a certain number of investments that I make into other funds because I feel like that is where things really get cranked up. And I'm not just talking about like venture capital, more venture capital funds. I'm talking about funds that are are hacked like mine was, uh, where it's it may be a crowd equity site, it might be a, a, a an angel group that got together of black women in South Carolina. You know, it may be this, this, and that. I think that when I'm able to turn that that lever uh, or flip that lever, I think that's when things really start getting interesting. And and I'm hoping to uh, be in that position. I think uh, a few of the revenue streams will that I'm working on will start helping that. And I think within a year, it'll it'll be more of a professional structured fund that I have. Yeah. Okay. That's so amazing. I can't watch. I can't wait to see that all like unfold for you now. So first like tell people where they can find your book um, and who it's for. It's like on oh, yeah. people in the tech world read this or is this for everyone? Oh no, it's not just for t- people in the tech world. It really, I mean, it, it, I know everybody says it's for everybody. It is for everybody. It really is. I mean, this people have read it. Uh, critics have said the same. Um, but the first group of people I think is, is if you're a woman of color, first group is if you're a woman of color from 25 to 45 and you have been sitting on an idea or something has fallen through or you are in the middle of of raising or uh, building your company 
and you want all the kind of like all the inspiration in the world and all the tools in the world to make that happen, this is going to be perfect for you. Outside of that, um, any person of color, any woman across the board, anyone, um, and that goes for LGBTQ uh, as well in that first tier, um, anyone who feels underestimated right now, you're going to find something from it. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter if you're, if you do data entry, if you work as a on-demand driver, if you are uh, doing a nine to, if you're doing like working at a restaurant, uh, any of those things, all the things I've done, uh, you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to find yourself along my journey, whether you are making $12 an hour or whether you have millions of dollars uh, under management or as part of your wealth, there's something along the way on that journey that will speak to you. And, um, and I've already seen it happen. I've seen a lot of uh, guys get a lot from this, which I, it surprised me to be honest with you, uh, guys from all backgrounds, because um, it's not super aggressive. And I, you know, like a lot of these books that guys are reading that are in the inspirational space are like, yeah, you got to go hard or go home, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you got to work out 50 hours a day. Mine is more like, um, a softer touch but at the same time it, it takes a lot of gumption as you said to 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 do what I did and um it does. I think that I think that you'll feel that adrenaline rush from this book for sure yeah and so lastly where can they pick it up what's your site where can they follow you you can go to it's about damn time.com for everything you can pick up the book the hardcover you can get the if you want it right now you don't want to wait for shipping just get that audio version get the ebook version do both gift it um it's about damn time.com is the hub. All right. And I'll link all that in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, Arlen, for this interview. I know it will inspire a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it.